Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this inaugural professorial lecture. My name is Donna Heddle. I'm the Acting Vice Principal of Research and Impact here at the University of the Highlands and Islands, and it's my great pleasure to be welcoming you to this inaugural lecture given by Professor Alexander Sandmark today. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, this event is being recorded, and if you have any questions, and I'm sure you will, if you could please put them in the, the Q&A um, facility rather than the chat. Please don't use the chat for that. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our uh, introdu introducing uh, uh, professor, and that is Professor Michael Vayner, who is the Dean of Research here at UHI. So it's over to you, Michael. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the principal and the University of the Highlands and Islands, I really am delighted to welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture from Professor Alex Mark. Now, Professor Sam Mark is an archaeologist with a strong research interest in Iron Age and medieval Scandinavia, and in particular the Viking Age and the Viking expansion in the West. Her personal chair recognizes the significant contribution she has made and continues to make to the field of medieval archaeology research in these areas. Professor Sandmark undertook her undergraduate and postgraduate studies at the University of London and obtained her PhD from University College London on the Christianization of Scandinavia. She then went on to the University of Uppsala, becoming program leader for the MA degree in Viking and early medieval Scandinavia before returning to University College London as a research fellow in its Institute of Archaeology. In 2009, she moved to Scotland and started working for the University of the Highlands and Islands in the Centre for Nordic Studies, first in Orkney and currently in Perth in association with the now extended Institute for Northern Studies. Alex is fascinated by Viking Age religion and the Christianization of Northwest Europe. Her interests also include assembly and political practice. And she has collaborated on the assembly project, TAP for short, a three-year international project funded by the Humanities in Europe Research Area, or HERA. Now TAP examined multidisciplinary multi evidence for the emergence of assembly sites and administrative frameworks across Northern Europe from AD 400 to 1500. Professor Sandmark's research strand was entitled Assembly and Colonization and explores the establishment of the North Thing organization and assembly sites in the areas of Norse settlement and colonization compared to the situation in the Viking homelands. This work resulted in the book Viking Law and Order, Places and Rituals of Assembly in the Medieval North published by Edinburgh University Press in 2017. In 2015, Professor Sam Mark led the Orkney and Shetland Digital Heritage Project. This was a community-based cultural heritage project through which stories connected to the Orkney and Shetland landscapes were captured using digital technology. Building on her interests in the islands, nations of the Pacific Ocean, developed during her PhD studies, Professor Sam Mark, together with Professor Donna Heddle, who we just heard of from and will be speaking again later today, are working on a project on sustainable tourism in Vanuatu. As part of the first year's work, existing cultural heritage sites were evaluated and future strategies suggested. Since then, Professors Sam Mark and Heddle have been involved in further work in Vanuatu and are currently developing an international tourist guiding qualification for the island nation. Other fieldwork based projects Alex is involved with are further excavation of Anunshog in Sweden. In 2017-18, a 14th century assembly cottage was excavated which is the earliest such building found archaeologically. A second project, 
funded by a British Academy and Leverhulme grant, involved geophysical survey and core sampling in the West mainland of Orkney, with the aim of examining possible traits of Viking Age and late Norse waterways, and evidence of this was indeed found. Professor Sam Mark is the initiator and series editor for the book series, The North Atlantic World, Land and Sea as Cultural Space, AD 400 to 1900, an interdisciplinary series that covers a wide geographical region, stretching from the Northern Europe and Scandinavia across to the Eastern seaboards of Canada and the United States of America, from the late Iron Age up to the early modern period. Alex's lecture today will outline and discuss gender roles in the Viking Age, with particular attention to how women and men have been perceived in previous research. I'm now truly delighted to hand over to Professor Sam Mark to deliver her inaugural professorial lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, uh, very much for that uh, kind introduction and also to Donna. I am just going to make sure that I can share my PowerPoint uh, with you. And I need to go into slideshow mode. Just not really. Oh, yes. There you go. I think that is all coming across to you clearly now, I hope. If not, please let me know. So, thank you very much for introducing me and for hosting me here today. It, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm very, very happy and, and proud to be here today. And um, as Michael said, um, the topic uh, of my, my lecture is uh, women and men of the Viking Age. And I have to say that from a personal perspective, it's, it's quite a surprise for me to be talking about this topic today. I, I never set out to study um, the roles of women and men um, at all. I've always been much more interested in, in other aspects of the past. Um, but just this has been a, a sort of natural development of my, my other uh, research interests, um, particularly as part of the assembly project when I started looking at the ex expansion um, Viking Age expansion from Scandinavia and going westward, um, and that involves a lot of um, discussion about you know male and female roles. Uh, also examining the role of women um, in parliament and, and politics and law, um, and, and I came across you know a number of articles and books discussing um, the roles of women and men, and I started seeing you know patterns in the in the argument and I thought well you know this this needs to be addressed I need to start talking about this and I need to start writing about this um and uh so so it, it's, it's it's I'm very happy that I'm, I'm able to do so finally and um so this lecture then will um give you an overview of of the research um, that's been done. Um, you know, we go far back in time and then up until very recently. I, I just picked up some key examples to show you uh, the general trends that we can see uh, in research in this particular area. Um, and then I will pick up, you know, some areas where I think we can um, particularly clearly see female involvement in society, um, and then also look at ways forward. How can we take research uh, on this topic to the next level? Um, and I think it's it's clear that you know I at least see certain problems uh, in the way that particularly particularly if women have been viewed, but but also men. Um, and well, it may be that because this is the Viking Age, the Viking Age is is the era of of raiding and violence, um, pillaging. You know that's that's what kind of the whole big hallmarks of the era that is the finding traits of the era and maybe because that gives us a masculine image that the women sort of automatically sort of get left behind a little bit um and there are certain tendencies that we can see in in research and i 
I've picked a quote here and um, I haven't given you a source because I haven't picked this to to, to pick on anybody at all. Uh, this is just from a, um, a summary article um, that's available online and I, I, I could actually have picked a number of uh, publications um, to get a, you know, a similar quote. But I will, I'll read it to you, um, first of all. Um, and it says, like many traditional civilizations, Viking Age society at home and abroad was essentially male dominated. Men did the hunting, fighting, trading and farming, while women's lives centered around cooking, caring for the home and raising children. The majority of Viking burials found by archaeologists reflect these traditional gender roles. Men were generally buried with their weapons and tools, women with household items, needlework and jewellery. Um, as I said, uh, it, it's a random quote, but it does really summarise so well, I think, the general sort of state um, of, of research, uh, especially when we're looking to big works summarising uh, the Viking Age. So we've got, uh, we've got women and men, uh, men have certain tasks, uh, they tend to be this traditional male task, you know, hunting, fighting, trading, and the farming. Um, and but women, they are centered around the home, cooking, and and children above all. And then we come to the next part, uh, which is uh, uh, burials. Um, um, uh, Viking burial, um, a lot of burials at least come with a number of artifacts, um, and we tend to label them. It will be especially in the past as either male or female items. And in that sense, we've also built up stronger ideas of what a woman would have done in life and what a man would have done in life. Um, so I think that what is needed here is is more nuanced view. Um, and I think that some really long standing assumptions about gender roles um, in Viking society uh, should be challenged. Um, and I am not saying that anybody deliberately um, is, is holding back at all. I think it's just um, a general acceptance and perhaps just not questioning um, certain aspects in, in such a detail that we should be doing. Um, and it's very easy. We all have assumptions at the back of our minds that perhaps we should be dealing with. Um, and um, I think um, with the women in Viking Age is something that we really see. Um, and also then um, for men. So we've got this the general idea then of um, um, traditional uh, women mainly staying at home uh, and doing housework at the farm. But then uh, we have also another side of Viking, Viking women. It's kind of a flip side here. Um, and that is a focus on certain exceptional strong women um, and these women feature above all in Icelandic sagas. Now these are, you know, literary texts. They are produced in Iceland um, and written down uh, in the 13th and 14th centuries and preserved in, in manuscripts. Um, so they're not histories, they're not written as history. They are, they are written as, um, you know, for, for, you know, for effect. Um, in, in certain cases, but they are seen to contain, you know, a core of uh, values that we can uh, refer back to the Viking Age. So, so that there's some of the histories we might read in there might not actually reflect the, the very people that are named, but we can imagine that people of that kind would have existed in, in the Viking Age. So, um, in these sagas, then we've got some fantastically strong women who achieve uh, really outstanding things, and um, um, so that the conclusion then uh, that that's reached then is that um, you know women had quite bleak prospects, but some women could achieve remarkable things, um, and because there is no real overarching discussion on how and why certain women perhaps could be so remarkable and, and others couldn't, um, we get this kind of image of um, Viking Age women as simultaneously strong and weak. And you find this actually a lot. If you start reading um, about sort of, again, summaries of the Viking Age, you find this a lot. Um, so I've got um, two, two quotes here. 
Um, the first one, uh, this much evidence that women held their own in Viking society, even though men ha had the upper hand. Um, and the second one, women could not be godly, so that's chieftains, but they were not without influence as they could make their presence felt and sometimes even had the last word. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there, a lot of time you find statements of that uh, women could do great things, um, but, and there's this, this quote from that but, but of course we don't know, but of course, um, and that but um, is sort of, it always lingers there and that creates this feeling that we actually don't know anything. Were they strong, were they weak, or were they both? Uh, and I think this is one of the, the sort of core problems that we are dealing with. Um, then we've also got two spheres um, that, you know, the male and the female sphere, um, and, and these feature a, a lot um, in the published research as well. Sometimes they're clearly spelled out, and other times they just kind of feature there in the background and, and but not quite mentioned. Um, and I would say that again, the problem um, is really that we have women um, viewed as an almost sort of homogenous group, and then we've got another almost homogenous group and they are the men. So they are two, two groups and they are really quite separate and there's not much overlap, or there's at least not much discussion about overlap between the worlds of women and the worlds of, or, of the world of men. Um, the female sphere then um, is seen as, you know, it's a passive sphere, it's called the private sphere, the domestic sphere. Uh, whereas the male sphere uh, is is active and it's public, so um, that means that the um, sometimes it goes as far as you know people think you know discussing what what you know what was in the minds of a, of a Viking Age woman. Uh, well, her mind was on the domestic sphere, on the farm, um, and her, not looking out towards the wider community. Um, and uh, whereas then the, the men are the ones who are engaging with, with politics and law, etc., and are constantly sort of traveling, um, either you know, going raiding, etc., or you know, traveling just outside the farm and engaging in, in the wider community. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the view that everybody is presenting, but it, it does come across. And, and something that is really frequent is that um, whatever domestic sphere is, or domestic task, you know, that's, that's not defined. We don't quite know what they are. Um, there is sometimes also a tendency to revert to what's called, you know, essential qualities of where women and men, so women then labelled inactive, maternal, tender, uh, and the men are dynamic, dominant, and, and violent. Um, and I think for women, particularly the sort of inactive trait is something that I think we really need to, to deal with. Um, the majority of, of women then are seen as as housewives uh, and the housewives are then you know within the domestic and the passive sphere then we've got you know these exceptional women um that, that i mentioned earlier um and they are then um called norm breakers um and they, they don't fit in to this female sphere that's been created for them and here we've got ritual specialists we have you know warriors travelers settlers etc So the next um, aspect then is that um, the um, sort of constant um, doubting of the female. Um, if we go back and we think about the the Icelandic sagas again, um, and then we've got the um, the powerful women um, in in the sagas. As I said, you know the sagas are literary creations. Um, they um, um, we don't know whether these women actually existed or not. We don't know whether you know these women um, achieved um, as much as it is actually stated uh, in in the sagas. Um, and those questions um, are constantly asked uh, when it comes to women. Um, and this is the the but 
that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, we know that so and so travelled, but could other uh, other women do this? We don't know. Um, and I think we're absolutely right um, to ask these questions. We need to ask these questions. This is our our job with you know trying to interpret the past. We really need to constantly question the source materials uh, and, and question our own thinking. But there is an imbalance here because the sagas also um, contain you know many many uh, famous men uh, and men that achieve remarkable things. Um, and there is a, there's been a, a you know a huge amount of scholarship about the reliability of the sagas um, as a whole, um, different types of genres. Some are more reliable than others, etc. But then when it comes to the saga characters, we don't see the same focus on questioning the individual saga characters. So we've got some some you know really you know famous. Um, personalities that appear in the sagas. So, for example, um, Egil Skallagrimsson, you know, one of the, the most famous um, sagas um, with the, the hero or anti-hero Egil. Um, and he, uh, he he's, you know, he takes part in, in, you know, many raids and battles. He's incredibly violent and can be really cruel at times. Um, but uh, there are no discussions saying, really, could, could this really have happened? Was Egil really this cruel? Um, but that's, it's more taken for granted, presumably because they're men. Um, then we've got and then the Njal saga, for example, um, he was incredibly skilled in law. Uh, and again, um, that's stated, but it's rarely questioned, you know, his personal abilities. Really, could he really be this skilled in law? Or is this an exaggeration? Could a man become this powerful? Um, those questions aren't asked. Um, so these examples um, are now from the um, from the sagas, but it, it, this really applies to you know other uh, types of evidence too. And I think just what I just want to get across is I think we need to have the same approach. Um, you know whether we're working with with men or whether we're working with women of the past. Um, so how about work then? Um, the work that women and men um, carried out as part of their, their daily lives. Um, there's been much work on um, trying to define uh, female work. What did uh, the women do when they stayed at home and um, at the farms? Uh, there's been work, you know, trying to um, address the question of what need uh, these women fulfilled in society. Um, and uh, so that's gone into a lot of detail. So we see here the female tasks are, are you know, you know, we can find kind of lists on them. Um, childcare, cooking, cleaning, milking, textile production, grinding corns, warming the beds. Um, so these female tasks then um, are tend to be then confined um, to the farm. Male tasks then, uh, on the other hand, um, are rarely defined. Um, they just um, tend to be the tasks that are not female. They became male. They become male. So anything that women um, are not doing. Uh, or are doing at the farm, that's a female one, and everything in the rest of, of, the, of society is male. Um, and that, that gives, you know, that's, that's a very limiting uh, when we're thinking about, you know, what women, what activities women could be involved in. Um, and this is, you know, very uh, clear in sort of era defining activities, uh, warfare, raiding, trading, um, settlement, um, travel. Um, and then we've got these general labels of what happened in society at this time. We've got Viking raiding, Viking activity, and of course the the word Viking um, is grammatically male. Um, you know, it, it it's a male raider, um, and I think when when we read it, uh, Viking activity, it comes across as as male rather than something that included the whole the whole of society. Um, so, in that sense, female participation is, is excluded. Um, 
and that's again uh, is, is something that that's a problem. Um, overlaps also between male and female tasks is something that that's rarely um, addressed. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of um, you know, sales is a big feature of the Viking Age. Sail making um, is a, you know, a, a priority for um, the Viking uh, raids and the travel across the sea. Um, so if the women made the sails and if it's the people who then travel across the sea, if they're all men, what happens when the sails need to be mended? Um, either the men would have to learn the tasks at home of mending the sails, or if they didn't do that, then the women would have to travel with them and be there and and and, and mend the sails on, on the travels. That's just an, an example. So travel, as I said, uh, is really seen as a as a male driven um, activity. Uh, and this is even um, if we um, exclude raiding, just in general, um, travel to settle elsewhere um, is mainly um, driven by, by men. Again, we've got the, these norm breakers, these exceptional women uh, who appear in the Icelandic sagas. We've got Oath the Deepminder, she's a Norwegian widow who crossed the North Atlantic um, and settled in Iceland um, as the head of, of the household. Um, we have uh, Freydis Eriksdotter, she travelled from Greenland um, to Vinland, so that's um, in America and um, Canada, and uh, famously killed five uh, women uh, because her husband refused to do so. Uh, and then we have uh, Gudrida, the far travelled. She was born in Iceland uh, and travelled to, to Greenland and also to Vinland as well as as to Rome. Um, but but they are again they are exceptions. But then if we look at other types of evidence, um, archaeology, written sources, and, and DNA from across areas of Scandinavian settlement, we can see evidence of uh, female um, travel. That there's no there's no question about that. Uh, but if we go to the research, then um, women seem to be very reluctant travelers. Uh, there's a very, there's a clear lack of, of female agency when it comes to to travel. Uh, I've listed some some quotes here. Um, female Gotlandic objects indicate tradesmen bringing uh, their women with them. Some settlers must have brought their wives with them. Some of the men appear to have arrived with their Scandinavian wives. The Scandinavians did take the women uh, with them to Eastern Europe. Grave goods often interpreted as gifts brought home by male raiders, also to wives and girlfriends. So it's all that female initiative is completely lacking here. Uh, makes me wonder, did women have no desire to travel, no thoughts about traveling, uh, no opinion about it, um, and never ever took the initiative to say, well, you know, let's go and, and settle somewhere else. Uh, also, it's the, the male ownership of women. Um, they're always taking their wives um, and, and they have this clear ownership of, of what happens uh, or ownership of a woman in their family. And uh, this is seen again in, in a number of different um, studies. Um, this one here is quite interesting. Uh, I mean, DNA is a really um, expanding area at the moment. And, uh, you know, I think DNA evidence needs to be treated um, with, with great care. And uh, I just wanted to use this one as, as an example, um, because this, this DNA study then, um, looking at Scandinavian DNA present um, in, in Scotland and also in Iceland. And in Orkney and Shetland, for example, the uh, degree of, of female DNA is, is relatively high. So you have Scandinavian males and females um, settling in these islands. Um, the interpretation then is that we've got family groups um, because there are, there are men and women and, and they come together as a, as a group. Um, and if you connect that then to this idea of, of taking wives together, um, then we've we've got the idea of all family groups traveling together. And are there any other, you know, single women, you know, within that? Are there any maybe sisters that came along or, or whatever? We don't know. And that that's that doesn't that's not at least discussed within these um, major conclusions. Um, then uh, we have so. Uh, 
we've got uh, on in the Western Isles, there is a, you know, much uh, lower percentage of, of female DNA. We've got mainly male Scandinavian DNA. So, okay, okay, that's male settlers. But then when they go across and they settle in Iceland, um, there is a lot of DNA um, that seems to um, that seems to indicate that um, male settlers um, came to Iceland with women um, from Scotland and, and Ireland. Um, so this is really seen to be mainly slave trading or, you know, taking wives again, as we're here, a substantial number of women t took wives from indigenous British populations there. Um, but a lot of it is seen to be, you know, um, slave trading and uh, sometimes, you know, the women are, are sex slaves um, and they don't have a choice for whether to go to Iceland or, or whether to, to stay at home. And if we look at the descriptions of um, wives traveling from Scandinavia across, it's, it's kind of the same. They didn't have a choice either. Um, so there is a lack of distinction here. I think um, is we have the same idea applied to um, women perceived as slaves and also um, wives. Um, so what about um, archaeological evidence then? Um, I have a quote here. It's a really, really well known and, and famous quote. Um, why is there a need to find females and not the uh, same need to find males who are by implication already present, active and the primary contributors to the archaeological record and the human past? Um, so this comes from um, a book called Engendering Archaeology, uh, Women and, and Prehistory from 1991. Um, and I use this because I think it summarizes the situation uh, really well, the situation that we were also had in, in uh, Viking Age archaeology. Um, so in the, particularly in the 1980s um, in, in Norway, first of all, um, there was a, a growing interest in women on the Viking Age and in, um, you know, gender um, archaeology. Um, and uh, at this time then, there, the, you know, articles did appear, you know, with, you know, the, exactly this kind of questions. How do we find the women in the archaeological material? Um, you know, where are the women? Why can't we see the women? And of course, as the point they're making here is that, you know, the women are there in the archaeological record. Um, but if we think that the norm is male and everything is created by men, of course, the women are very, very difficult to find. Um, and, you know, Archaeology has definitely moved on uh, since this time, but there are still some uh, lingering problems when it comes to interpreting um, the evidence. Um, so Anna Stalsberg is one of the uh, really well-known Norwegian archaeologists, and in you know in the 1980s, then she pointed to discrepancies in the interpretation of of, of grave goods, um, and uh, she pointed out that. Uh, in graves, the way you found where men were buried and they were buried with scales and, and weights um, that was seen to indicate that they were, you know, had an active role as traders. When they had the same situation with women, um, they were not traders, they were merchants' wives. Um, and she pointed out then that um, in, in Russia, she had, a, you know, a, a, she studied, studied a lot of time graves in, in Russia and uh, the Scandinavian settlements there. And she found that 31 scales um, or great graves with scales or weights in, in 31 burials. And of these 19% were in female graves, 32 then in, in couples graves with a man and a woman, 45% uh, in male graves. And her conclusion was they do not suggest an unimportant status for women in trade. So, you know, quite understated, but you know, still. Um, this was a really good starting point, but unfortunately, we haven't really moved on that far in terms of, of this idea about interpretation. Um, I take the example of the the um, the grave from Birka BJ five at one, um, which has received so much attention in, in the last uh, few years since 2016 when this grave was was published um, again, um, and um, so this um, 
situation was that this is a reinterpretation um, of the um, skeleton you can see here uh, on the right hand side uh, from a 10th century chamber grave. Um, and this um, skeleton uh, was always seen as male, or it's interpreted as a male warrior looking at the, the grave goods. It's an absolutely exceptional burial. Uh, it's got complete uh, equipment uh, of a professional warrior. Um, and it's been seen as one of these most outstanding, you know, male um, warrior graves. Uh, but then recently, the, the skeleton's re-examined uh, by Anna Shellstrom, and you know it said it's clearly female, and the sex was confirmed by DNA analysis. Um, and the, my point with this slide is that when this happened, the debate about the meaning of the grave goods, you know, absolutely uh, came alive, you know, all over the internet. And uh, the, this grave that had ne it never been questioned whether it was a warrior uh, or not. But now, because it was a woman, um, then the meaning of the grave goods was debated and asking for all kinds of additional evidence to prove that this was indeed a warrior. And again, I'm not saying that we should not be having these discussions, but I'm saying that we need to make sure that we have the same standards, whether we're thinking about men or, or women. And in that sense, I think we still have you know, some way to go. Um, and this takes me to the next aspect, which is power, um, religious or political power. Um, a really well known aspect again of, of Viking Age, um, and especially when it comes to norm breakers, then are the female ritual specialists. Um, the CRS or the Velva, you can see here this fantastic um, stamp uh, from the pharaohs. Um, and uh, these uh, Velvas are they're known from sagas and they're also known from archaeological evidence. Um, and they have been, you know, really well received um, in terms of um, uh, in the sort of kind of the, the big sort of research community, uh, and it's, it's quite well um, accepted that women held um, religious power, political authority. That's more difficult um, to, as in, you know, being as popular. And this, we can see this kind of spilling over again in the burial evidence. Um, I've got some examples here of, of burials that are similar. So we've got um, boat burials um, from um, Tuna and Badalunda in, in Sweden, and then very similar burials from Vendel and Valsjärde, um, about 80 kilometers away. Uh, and these burials are very similar in terms of grave goods and the size of the boat and the type, etc. But in Tuna, uh, the, the buried um, people are women, and the other sites, uh, they're men. And in uh, interpretations, then the men are interpreted as holding secular powers and being close allies to the king, but the women have been seen as, as cult leaders, um, so not being given that um, political power. And again, this is this pattern that we've seen um, elsewhere too. I think change is definitely coming, but it's it's a bit slow. Um, to move on, also in um, translations, we see this, um, and I, I was just looking at, at you know saga translation and, and looking at particular terms that are used for men and women, uh, and we've got um, these terms in Old Norse. Then uh, uh translated as housekeeper or stewardess, it sounds a little bit like a housewife. Um, and then we've got the the corresponding male term then, which is rauda mother. Um, influential man or, or a manager or steward. Um, and then uh, I have an example from Njal Saga where, you know, we've got both terms appearing. We've got the Rada man and the Rada Kona in the same sentence here and suggesting that they had similar functions and they were, had a stewardship of, of a farm. But in, in, in some of the translations then, you know, this, this um, housekeeper, she is, doesn't appear in the text. Um, so we've got he and a Helga put men in charge of it. That's the translation of 2001. Or stewards ran the farm. And uh, as we know, when when the standard is male, stewards uh, is would not be seen to you know include women. Um, the women have to be absolutely spelled out in order for them to be there. Um, so I think we need to really pay attention to the original text 
and also so should um, translators when uh, um, producing uh, new versions of, of text. So I've, I've summarized some of the issues there and I'm thinking what about what, what's the way forward? How, how should we take this to the next level then? Uh, and I've got one word there, I think necessity. And by necessity, I mean that thinking about what people of the time needed, what uh, were their lives like and what, what restricted them uh, in life. <clears throat> so housewives, first of all then, um, is the term, I mean, it comes, goes back to the old Norse term, but for us, you know, the modern definition of housewife is as a woman whose occupation is looking after a family, cleaning the house, uh, who doesn't have full time work outside the home, etc. Um, and uh, that's very much then influenced by 19th century Victorian female ideal. Um, upper and middle class women who then should be free from manual work and be able to be indoors, oversee the home, etc. Um, and it was just at this time that you know traditional agricultural society was breaking up and urban lifestyles and mentalities, you know, they started um, developing. So it doesn't that ideal does not fit in with the lives of subsistence farmers of the Viking Age. They had very, very different lives. And I think just looking at subsistence farming is something that can uh, provide us with more insight into the lives of, of people. Uh, so I've got here an image, um, I think this one from the Isle of Skye, um, of uh, women who are, you know, carrying peat on the way back to the farm and walking and also knitting um, at the same time. So the lives of crofters are, you know, they're quite well documented. Uh, we know a lot about them, and because basic farming actually didn't has didn't change very much in terms of the the general tasks between the Viking Age and, and the early crofters, um, so we can you know use that as a, as a parallel, and we can see that you know crofting women worked incredibly hard from morning to night. They were dairy farming, growing crops, peat collecting, knitting, cooking, etc. And the option of not doing any work or staying indoors is just not it wasn't available to them. We also have um, shared work. Um, on the left hand side, I've got uh, an, a, a photograph from the Shetland Museum. It, it, it was called the Delling, when they're sort of digging the fields. And there are some films of this as well. And it, it's absolutely fantastic work. It's work that's done together. Uh, by every, you know, all the, all, this, all the adults at the farm uh, and it, it's done in rhythm. They're singing while they're doing this and everybody has to keep up. Uh, there is no way of, 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 you know, being too slow because then you're out of sync with the rest of everybody. Um, and we, so I think thinking about men and women actually working together on the farm um, and, and also, um, you know, children and everybody being uh, involved. Um, and shared work is something that we is starting to appear, for example, in the studies of Icelandic shielings. Um, in the sagas, we are told that these are places of women um, and they were the ones who spent all summer at the farm. Um, and but archaeological excavations I have seen that the tasks at this farm were very varied. Um, so task that's you know would be assigned to you know either men or women they're both found there so either both sexes are present or were present or women were there and they carried out um male tasks tasks that we would see as male the economic value uh, of female work is something that we you know i think needs to be brought um to the fore uh, i think the idea of um the understanding of housewives, uh, the modern understanding that of housewives not bringing in income has you know, prevailed too much. Um, and I think dairy farming is something that we can absolutely see as bringing in income. Um, textile production, um, very clearly so. Um, and this is um, a female task seen in written sources, archaeological evidence, and um, woolen cloth called uh, Vavmal. Uh, it was really a key product at a high economic value. Uh, so Michelle Smith, for example, has shown that in Iceland, textile um, became the legal mode of payment. So that's that's how important it was in economic terms. 
And of course, woolen cloth was used for a variety of purposes from clothing um, to tents and sails. Um, and uh, so in that sense, because uh, we can say that female work was one of the prerequisites of the Viking Age voyages, and therefore then in extension uh, also for the, the Viking Age itself. itself. And um, I think that is something that, you know, that, that women were just sharing um, the, all, this whole experience of, of Viking society um, in terms of, of, of travel and the whole um, um, sort of mechanics that went with it is important to emphasize too. Um, women in towns is another interesting aspect. Um, there's been really interesting work by um, uh, Swedish archaeologist Eva Andersson Strand um, looking at textile production, specialist textile production in the Viking Age town of Birka. Um, and she's shown that um, this uh, textile production was such um, high quality and such volume that, first of all, the women who were involved in this um, must have been, um, you know, they were highly skilled and they, at least some of them must have been in full time employment. Um, also, that um, there seems to have been, you know, really wealthy women, and they are buried uh, outside the town with textile implements. And she said that these women may have been uh, the leaders of the textile uh, workshops, and that these workshops were not necessarily family driven. Then, as we would see perhaps with the Viking Age farm, and that it may also have involved single women. And you know, this concern perhaps just not surprising at all, but in terms of, of Viking Age archaeology, that's quite revolutionary, actually, um, and, and, and really worthwhile stressing. And she also to the point that, uh, and other people have said too, that um, here the grave goods again suggest that women were actually active traders, both buying and selling. The other area where we can definitely see female involvement then uh, is law and, and politics um, and here the background slide you can see um, a viking um, thing site or assembly site um, you know it's Eichel's thing site in, in Upland in Sweden and uh, this um, the assembly has been seen as an exclusively male area um, and Again, if you look at you know, general descriptions of, of the thing, it's always, it, it used to be said anyway, participants, uh, there were um, the meeting of all chieftains, all men, all the free men, all the thing men. Um, and these uh, people are then obliged or encouraged to attend the assembly. And um, Old Norse thing mother, um, really this could sound that like mother, you know, in modern Icelandic means, means man. Uh, but in Old Norse, it means a human, so this is actually a thing, person, as uh, it could refer to, to women too. So, the, the, and the thing mother, the thing men are landowners, they are the ones who should attend the assembly. So that means we have um, both uh, women and men. Um, there are a number of women who, according to law, had access to the assembly. Um, widows, they were landowners. Therefore, they could attend the assembly. Um, we also have something called ring women. These were unmarried women uh, without close relatives, and they could therefore inherit land and, and goods. Uh, they could be at the assembly. Women who had been in disputes with other women, women who maintained a household because the man was away or ill or whatever reason, um, women who were acted as witnesses. So, by you know putting all these women together and looking at numbers you know one sort of suggestion is that we might be looking at about 10 percent of the participants may have been women so seeing them as, as male spheres is is uh giving us the wrong image we also need to think about um that not all not all men um had the right to attend uh, the assembly we have um, loan workers, if they had, uh, you know, didn't have their own land or a very, very small patch of land, they could not um, sort of actively participate in the assemblies. Um, they're dishonored, people have been outlawed, for example, um, slaves likewise, and those not, not able-bodied, um, the old, sick, disabled as well. 
um, they could attend, but they were not required to do so. Again, that means that the idea of, of women and men um, or, or the assembly as the arena of, of all the men just doesn't hold. Um, I would like to also think about women as, as individuals um, moving away from the housewife, thinking about other female roles too. Uh, I've already mentioned widows, we've got like, concubine, concubines, um, single women, um, perhaps professions, weavers, etc. Um, we've also got the ring women um, that in the, in, in the Norwegian law say that in the, in the Icelandic one, she could act as if she were a son uh, in certain matters. Um, and, you know, they uh, may have been a really relatively large group, all these women together in, in local uh, communities. Um, then we also need to think about slaves and, and servants. Um, and uh, we can see that there were, you know, different types of, uh, of slaves um, and they had certain tasks. Um, we've got female slaves, say Seta, the one who weaves, Adegia, uh, she's the one who bakes or she's the housekeeper. Um, so, first of all, you know, if these women were, were present in the house, then that would have changed the life for, for the, uh, the woman of the house. Um, and also, what about their work um, that these women did, the slave women? We, we again, know very little about that. Um, and also thinking about if, you know, if we do have women who whose main focus was to produce textile and clothes for the family, and it wasn't even for economic gain um, or gain. Um, that is still important work, now, but it shouldn't be dismissed. Um, and this is important for you know the the family's survival, for everyone's survival. So the work that you know they did uh, is is crucial too, even though it might not have big economic or societal implications. Um, so personality and status uh, is something that, of course, is really important. Viking society was incredibly hierarchical. Um, that meant that you know people uh, who were born in the right family, um, with high status, um, uh, wealthy, uh, or had you know good marital status, um, you know had um, more power uh, than others, um, and also those people were probably more likely to gain the right kind of experience. Uh, in order to be able to act on their own in society. Um, and then also we're thinking about, you know, people are, are different. Um, some people like to take more space than others. Uh, some people are more ambitious than others. So that, um, that will give us more a variation as well within um, the, the big group of women. And then also thinking that, you know, not all men were powerful. Uh, we've got the male slaves, we have the lone workers, the elderly, uh, the infirm, um, etc. So, you know, slaves um, or servants in a household, they had, you know, no family or extended network that could support them. They were really dependent on the, on the support of the family um, whose house they, they were living in, who they were working for. So that means that the power relationship, you know, must be reconsidered. Um, and if, for example, they're thinking about, you know, the relationship between free women and male slaves, for example. So we can't say that all women were more powerful, or all men were more powerful than all women. And um, finally, um, the role of the home and the farm uh, is another one that I, I think we should uh, think about as well. Uh, if we label the farm as, you know, part of this passive sphere, the private sphere, um, you know, where everything is focused on, on the family, then in, in the grand scheme of things in society, it becomes uh, insignificant. Um, but we know that, you know, noble women uh, played a central role at ceremonial and ritual banquets. Um, and, you know, these um, took place um, at, at the farm. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes, of course, we've got like the, the image I hear on the right is Borgen Lofoten in, in northern Norway, which is an absolutely, you know, exceptional um, farm building or, you know, and, and 
it's it's a big hall, eight to three meters long um, and uh, nearly ten meters wide. Um, and we know it. That this is clearly a place where you know big, uh, important political meetings took place inside. Um, but so that's one example. We can also see that at, at the lower level, uh, even you know uh, poorer farms would have held gatherings uh, in the houses. And even if that would have been a less political significance, it's still actually not uh, a private sphere. Um, and, uh, you know, the women working um, on these farms were, you know, certainly, uh, you know, not not passive. Um, and that is really uh, the wrong word. So my final slide then, um, it, just to think about um, the different aspects of of life and what what you know what drove life forward, and uh, you know we thinking about subsistence farming, um, the need to produce food and clothing for everybody. That the sort of preoccupation of, of everybody and um, having that you know facing that daily doesn't leaves in terms of what you might want to do. Um, you know, you know, the questions are like, could 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 women use an axe? Well, I think everybody facing that uh, dilemma, we need firewood, then you learn to use an axe. It's, I think, the choices that we think that people might have had and um, they didn't necessarily have. In terms of travel, um, in migration theory, we talk about push and pull factors. Um, people are sometimes pushed away from their home for, you know, because of natural um, catastrophes or, um, political disagreements, etc., or they can be pulled away from home. There's attractions elsewhere, um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, you know, why wouldn't women be involved uh, in those activities? And they are also affected by you know both pull and push factors. Warfare. Um, so Charlotte Hayden Hannah Jonsson, when she's discussing um, the female warriors, for example, and, and she pointed out that. Um, you know, taking a warrior or a military leadership role is perhaps not optional. Choosing not to interact with war is a position of privilege. And I think for me, that makes great sense with what I've been thinking about from the, the farming um, aspect of life, that um, choice, uh, you know, was not as varied as, as, you know, the choices that we have today. Um, and in terms of of travel, uh, we, we do know that, you know, women and children, you know, work present, for example, with uh, the great army that traveled around and, and, and took England in the ninth century. There were women, there were children there. And from a modern perspective, we might think, well, that's that's not a good thing to, to bring up your children. Uh, but obviously, you know, people in the past had to have different views on this. Um, the final point then uh, is also about, um, you know, leadership, um, thinking about leadership um, that comes in different forms. Um, and female leadership can involve, you know, strategy, diplomacy. It's something that we see with with medieval queens. They um, one of their great roles was to, you know, create um, good diplomatic relationships between powerful families. So I um, just to finish, I, I hope I've managed to give you an overview of of this data of research and um, also the way forward and to see that there is there is so much more to do, uh, but we have plenty of, of evidence um, to work with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Listening to that wonderful lecture reminded me of a quote um, from Plutarch's essay handily entitled On Listening to Lectures, and he said, for the mind does not require filling like a bottle, but rather like wood, it only requires kindling to create in it an impulse to think independently and an ardent desire for the truth. Thank you for your truth today, Professor Sandmark. Now, uh, just to remind everyone that if you do have a question for Professor Sandmark, you can pop that into the question and answers um, section there to join the many questions that are there already. So I'll make a start with asking some of the questions. And the first question I'm asking, uh, Alex, it's actually a number of questions have come in on the topic of, of um, men involved in textiles and weaving. Um, and one person notes that uh, in medieval and late, later England, males were involved in some areas of textile work, such as weaving and wool combing. Does that occur in, in the Viking area? And if so, should it be more acknowledged? 
Well, I mean, some we can see that you know when we're coming to the to the late Middle Ages, then that beca it becomes a male task. Um, so we've got the horizontal loom in, in the Viking Age, uh, um, and uh, and that well, it's, that is above all, it really seems to be connected uh, with with women. It, as I said, I think that men must have been involved to some extent, absolutely. And you think about, you know, fishermen, for example, they're very skilled with, you know, um, mending nets, etc. And I, so I do think that to some extent it happened. But I think perhaps this overall idea of, of the um, big production of textile in, for economic benefit, that seems to have been, um, you know, female domain. But but it is interesting because textile production sometimes it, it's it's male and sometimes it's female and it varies between time periods um, a lot. Yeah, thank you. Another question is re private and public spheres. I mean that's usually a nineteenth century concept attributed to Jürgen Habermas. But how can we think about such spheres in a Viking Age context? Yes, it's a good question. It's because it it appears to. Uh, some extent in the sagas, um, in, in, there are some quotes that in, do refer to kind of indoor space and outdoor space. Then there is um, a, one or two sections in the Icelandic law Graugaus, um, and it talks about um, women sort of being you know in and stock, so inside the threshold, and that's sort of it. And that's sort of seen as, as the female sphere. So it does appear, but only on a very few occasions. And I think that those occasions are so few that it, it, it and despite that, you know, that it's mentioned so rarely, it's really taken a hold and seen to be seen as this big organizer of life in the Viking Age. And I think that's taking it um, too far. And also, in terms of practicalities, I can't see how that works. I think it's more of one of those um, kind of symbolic divisions, perhaps, that we see in certain written sources. But it's, it's not that common, but it does appear, and that's why it's made such a big impact. Thank you. Another question, which I rather like, I must admit. As girls matured into women, were they considered lucky until something unlucky happened to them? Uh, either way, could a woman change her luck? Oh, what a good question. Um, I mean, the luck spirits is, is quite a, a big thing in sort of the whole idea of other mythology, etc. On the other hand, uh, sometimes, you know, this bit of sort of predestination in there as well. Um, maybe they could, but it might have been quite hard, I think, is my answer to that. Thank you. Another question is, um, could you, what do you think were the roles of the two women in the Oseberg burial? Yes, haha. <laughs> well, that is a good question, actually, because that uh, is another example um, of, you know, how we interpret uh, the women. Um, so when I talked about the, um, the Badalunda, Tuna burials and the Vendela Valsi other ones and the saying that the, the, the women in Tuna is seen as, as cult leaders. Um, you know, we have another, you know, we have examples of that. And the Ulsterberg burial, of course, is, is one where I mean, we've had a queen in there, but a lot of the time, um, you know, leadership instead. Uh, but, you know, equivalent made male burials, we've got the Gugsat ship, for example, um, and that's always, you know, attributed with political power. Um, and, and I would like to absolutely see the same way that I don't see why this woman, you know, in particularly would not have had political power and absolutely a, a leader in, in society. That can, of course, also have, you know, ritual um, associations and implications for the role, but that applies, I think, for, for women and men. Um, uh, and that's another point, actually, that um, in, in written material, we see the idea that um, men um, what could be kind of sort of secular leaders, but also have um, ritual leadership as well. But in, when it comes to the interpretation of the archaeology, that, that's rarely there. Then they are just political leaders. So there is some kind of discrepancy there, I think.
Um, thank you. Now, uh, another questioner asks, uh, they would be very interested in what your concept, what you mean by a strong woman, and whether being a strong woman means that you're undertaking male activities. Yes. Um, yeah, I really hate that term, actually. <laughs> I try not to use it. Um, but it's one that comes up again and again. Um, so what do I what do I mean? Well, I think I used it in a sort of like stereotypical kind of way with these women who are the you know labeled the norm breakers, the ones who can yes achieve things. I I would say achieve things that um, many say only men could do, and that's where that but comes in. Oh, but could they? Because only the men could do this. Um, having said that, I don't think that. <laughs> Viking age women aspired to be men. Uh, I think they were very happy, you know, being women, but, uh, you know, they could be powerful women in their own right. Um, and I'm just something along the same lines there. Is there evidence of healers being particularly male or female? Um, healers, um, well, it, it, talking about uh, sort of sorceries or, or healers um so healers it does seem if you talk about medicine that does seem to have been female um there's very little evidence of this um and i really that's something that i, I would love to more more about and i do think that you know more research could be done on this um it does seem to be something that um it is female and uh could well, you know, have overlaps with with sorcery and, and magic practices, etc. If you're thinking about herbs, etc., and of course that was mainly then a, a female domain. Thank you. Another questioner inquires: Can you comment on the use of keys as a symbol for women in the Viking Age? Is this a very dated concept? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, the it goes with the concept of of the housewife, of course. Um, and uh, it, the, it, the key is mentioned again in some recent sources, and then we've got those, you know, lots of, of graves, female graves with uh, keys found within them. And uh, it was for a while, it was really sort of taken for granted that, you know, you've got the housewife, you know, with the keys and the keys then symbolized the, you know, the power of the farm because, you know, she could lock the stores or you know, making sure that nobody got to the food, etc. Um, but it's it's been pointed out that men are buried with keys too. Um, and, you know, that's not really been looked at in a great extent. And also if if the housewife and the key are so, you know, closely linked, then, you know, we don't have enough graves for all those all those housewives and all those ladies of the house. Um, so yes, that concept is increasingly actually being um, questioned, and uh, it it's not taken for granted anymore. As it, but it really really did, and it was part of that the ideal image of of the housewife with her keys. Thank you. Another question comes in. It says you discussed rather kind of in regards to translation. What role do you think this term actually imply implies? Yeah, that's it's really that's an interesting one. Um, it see it well. It seems to have you know different meanings in different contexts. I think because we do have it um and, and like a runic inscription where it seemed to be more sort of like the ruler of the house um in the icelandic sagas the examples there it seemed that you know this man and and uh, the woman they were sort of hired to manage the farm um so i think that it, we need to look at you know the runic inscription is, is 11th century um and, and from um, Sweden, so that's a whole different aspect. So I think that it does vary a little bit, but at times it does seem to be um, somebody who's really, um, you know, the the ruler of the house. Um, but for, and for men, sometimes it's just influential man. Um, so there is a little bit of of variation there. Thank you. Um, I think we've really come, unfortunately, to the end of. Question time. I know there's a lot of other questions there, and I'm very sorry if people haven't had their questions answered, but do feel free to send them in. Um, it's now my great pleasure um, to invite Alex to join us all in the professoriate. Um, the, the title of professor is, is given only to highly accomplished and recognised academics. In fact, it's regarded, certainly in this country, as being the highest rank in academia. So what do professors do? 
Usually they have advanced degrees such as masters or doctorates. They will offer, often manage their, their subject areas, conduct advanced research, much of which will be published, and they will supervise and mentor postgraduate students. Uh, if that's not enough, of course, they will also uh, excuse me. Um, they will also act as ambassadors for their institutions representing the university in the wider context. They would uh, often working pro bono for the communities in which they are based and how very true that is for us all here at UHI. Um, they are aspirational and inspirational role models for progressing academics and peers at all levels, and especially again important here at UHI in their mentoring and developmental role. Uh, being the, awarded the role of professor is one of the most privileged moments in the career of an academic. The University of the Highlands and Islands is officially just over 10 years old. The concept of a Highland University itself is not new, of course, as early as 1653, Sir Thomas Urquhart proposed the University of Cromarty. But by the standards of the much older traditional institutions, we are but infants learning to walk. However, we already have a professoriate in the region of 50 professors specialising in subjects including diabetes research, northern studies, archaeology, history, digital health, marine sciences and so much more. And we can now add medieval archaeology to the list. I received my professorship in 2013 and my subjects interdisciplinary northern studies and I'm based at the Institute for Northern Studies Orkney campus. My experience in the role of professor at the University of the Highlands and Islands has been one of great joy and uh, great rewards and I'm sure that our new professor of medieval archaeology will also have a hugely rewarding experience in her new role. Please join me in welcoming to the professoriate of the University of the Highlands and Islands, Professor Alexandra Sandmark. Uh, it's a wonderful moment. Yes, I'm so proud of you, Alex. Sorry, that's not in the script. Um, I would like to thank everybody uh, today, uh, Michael Rainer, for introducing Alex, Jill and team for organising the event, Alex herself for her wonderful lecture. And you all, our marvellous audience with your fabulous questions, for joining us on this very special day. Um, I can let you know that the video, this was recorded, of course, the video will be available on the YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks, and you can see a link about that um, uh, in the questions and answers there. Um, wonderful messages for you, uh, Alex, in the question and answers in chat, so please be sure to look at them. Uh, it just remains for me to invite you to the next event um, in this series. It is um, the uh, inaugural professorial lecture of Professor Michael Rayner entitled Swimming Us Against the Tide, the journey from interested spectator to active researcher. And that's on the 22nd of September at 4 p.m. You can register for that at www.uhi.act.uk events. Um, and I'd just like to thank everybody once again for joining us on this wonderful occasion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna.